For many people, the Southern Railway and the Southern region of British Railways are inevitably associated with moving large numbers of commuters each day in and out of the capital. However, there was much more to it than that. In this program, we present a miscellany of films made between the 1930s and the 1960s on the eastern and central divisions of the, of the SR, which as well as providing some probably unique views of the system taken over a period of four, some 40 years, will demonstrate just how much interest there was to be found in the railways of the southeast of England in that period. We begin at London Bridge Station in 1930. One of the first of Monsell's brand new schools class 440s, number 908, Westminster, backs onto its train. For a short while after these locomotives were introduced, they ran without smoke deflectors. Still at London Bridge, we have some rare Duffet colour footage taken in 1938 of 1491, a Wainwright E-Class 440. An E-4 class 062 tank is in the goods yard at Sutton as an L-12 440 424 arrives with the Portsmouth train. Later, number 433, another member of the class, designed by Dougal Drummond for the London South Western Railway and later modified by Yuri, is seen at Sutton Station. The third rail is in place for the new electric services. St. Paul's today looks down over a very different London skyline to that of the early 1930s. We are back at London Bridge on a rather murky Saturday, probably in 1931. A former London Brighton South Coast Railway 464 tank, number B327, leaves the station with the two o'clock Saturdays only for Brighton. The first part of the film is also a reminder of just how grim conditions could be in the days before the Clean Air Acts in the 1960s. This is New Cross, blanketed in fog. C.J. Bernard, the man who made this film, or the Baltic tank, between London Bridge and the flyover beyond Norwood Junction, must have spent a lot of time poring over timetables, or else, as we shall see, he was just plain lucky. The electric train bearing the filmmaker soon catches up with that hauled by the Baltic tank. So the steam train catches up when the electric unit stops. What looks like a Brighton E4062 tank can be seen. The electric has pulled ahead at Norwood Junction, where B327 is seen again. And on the flyover beyond the junction, these lovely shots of the Baltic tank can be seen. Moving on to East Croydon, one of Monsell's N-class moguls, introduced on the southeastern Chatham in 1917, passes through the station. Like many Eastern Division mainline trains in the 1930s, the formation includes Pullmans. The Baltic makes another appearance. These superb tank locomotives were rebuilt by Monsell as 460 tender engines in the 1930s. The derailment of one of the River Class 264 tanks at Sevenoaks in 1927 rather prejudiced the Southern against the use of large tank locomotives and express trains. A King Arthur on the Down Southern Bell 
completes this sequence at East Croydon. We have now gone down the southeastern main line to Sandling Junction near Folkestone. A schools class 440 passes through the station on an up express. The branch to Hythe and Sandgate, which closed completely in 1951, diverges here. These films were made on 9.5 mm stock in the early 1930s. Among the locos seen are an F1 class 440 on the main line stocking service and an elderly Sterling designed 01 class on the Hythe branch train. A Lord Nelson 460 passes through Sandling Junction with a boat train consisting of a typical southern mixture of Pullmans and ordinary stock. The next part of the programme concentrates in Folkestone and in particular the branch to Folkestone Harbour. Our films of this line will span a period of nearly 30 years. Another Lord Nelson, this time at Folkestone Junction where the harbour branch diverges. An R1 class 060 tank drifts down towards the harbour with vans consisting of passengers' luggage. This is shortly followed by the boat train itself, hauled by another R1. In the 1930s, roll-on, roll-off ferries were still a thing of the future. This is how cars for the continent were dealt with at Folkestone Harbour at that time. One of the Southern Railway steamers leaves the pier to begin the channel crossing to Boulogne in the early 1930s. Shunting at the harbour is one of the former Southeastern Chatham P-Class 060s, number 27. This loco was preserved on withdrawal over 30 years later and can now be seen on the Bluebell Railway in Sussex. One of Maunsell's powerful Z-Class 080 tanks was on duty also. Though it was only three quarters of a mile long, Double-track Folkestone Harbour branch was one of the most spectacular sections of railway in the whole of the British Isles. The reason for this was simply the branch's ruling gradient of 1 in 30. Boat trains had to slog up the hill to the junction, with maybe as many as five tank locomotives working the train. In this 1930s scene, there are two R1 class 060 tanks at the front and another pair banking at the rear. The train in this sequence was probably the Golden Arrow. We will come back to this line and indeed this famous train shortly. But before that, following the chronology of this sequence, we have some very rare film made on the Southern in the dark days of 1940. 14-year-old Ray Stevens filmed these scenes near Beckenham Junction in May and June 1940 on his father's 9.5 millimeter home movie camera. But one of Wainwright's C-Class 060s headed a down through goods train. Schools class 916, White Gift, heads an up express. On Friday the 31st of May, King Arthur 778, Sir Pelias, hauls a Dunkirk evacuation train through Beckenham Junction. This is followed by C-Class 060 1572 on a down goods. The boy filming the train is now chairman of the society which has preserved 592 of the class, which is now preserved on the Bluebell Railway. C-Class locos 1702 and 1715 bring another of the Dunkirk trains through Beckenham Junction.
E-Class 1175 powers a train of GWR stock containing more soldiers rescued by the little ships. The local of the next train, one of 600 run in the space of a week to move some 335,000 men, is L-Class 440-1773, built ironically by Borsig of Berlin in 1914, one of only 10 German-built mainline locomotives ever to run in Britain. A down goods in charge of a U1 class 260, number 1904, heads towards the junction. An unidentified King Arthur heads a down express along the same stretch of track. Finally in this sequence, some scenes shot at Orpington in June 1940, as a schools class 440 approaches the station, a C class 060 and an H class tank are glimpsed in the yard. A schools class on an up express passes the carriage shed, which bears signs of damage by enemy action. The phony war was definitely over. Back at Folkestone Harbour, to observe the changing scene on the branch in the 1950s. A steamer from France reverses into her berth. A train comes down the incline to the harbour to meet it with an R1060 tank in charge. With two R1s at the front and another at the back, a train begins a slog up the incline. Seen further up the incline on another occasion, this time with three R1s on the front and one on the back, the odd coach being a blood and custard vehicle. The branch joined the main line at Folkestone Junction where a BR standard class 5 passes through the station. A bullied light Pacific in original condition passes through without stopping on a boat train service to Dover. Schools class 440 is on the up service. In the late 1950s, rebuilt Bully Pacifics were a common sight in Kent, in this period before many of these lines were electrified. Number 34012, Launceston, adds the Folkestone portion of the Man of Kent. This was the last title to be bestowed on a steam hauled passenger train on the southern region. It ran from June 1953 to June 1961 between Charing Cross, Folkestone and Dover, with some workings extending to and from Margate. Back at Folkestone Harbour, the SS Deal is being loaded. 
and the change of motive power on the incline has become apparent. As a replacement for the aging R1s, British Railways transferred a number of Western Region 57XX Pannier tanks to take over banking duties on the branch in the late 1950s. One of these rolls down to the harbour. By April 1960, seven of these locos were based at Folkestone Junction Shed to work both Folkestone Harbour and Dover. Anyone who remembers the Pannier tanks in their heyday or who has seen and heard them will appreciate the spectacular sound as they bark their way up the 1 in 30 gradient towards Folkestone Junction. Two pannier tanks leave the harbour station with a train of ten carriages and a van. The original harbour at Folkestone was built for the Admiralty at the time of the Napoleonic Wars by Thomas Telford. It was silted up and was virtually derelict when purchased by the South Eastern Railway in 1843. At first, sailings were subjected to tidal restrictions, but improvements to the harbour throughout the 19th century enabled it both to cope with the increasing size of steamers, and also for it to be navigable at all phases of the tide. Between 1952 and 1960, the Golden Arrow returned to Folkestone Harbour for the outward journey. It left Victoria at 1 p.m., arriving at the harbour around 2.30. However, as the return service was via Dover, the empty stock had to be moved to there in time for the 4.58 p.m. departure for London. The Great Western Pannier Tank brings this typically southern train into Folkestone Harbour Station. Luggage containers conveyed on the second vehicle are later seen being craned onto the ship, are identical to those observed in the 1930 sequence. As the steamer leaves for France, she passes the TSS Canterbury, tied up at the pier. This vessel, then the pride of the Southern Railway fleet, entered service on the 15th of March, 1929. Before leaving Folkestone, there is a chance to revisit Sandling Junction, last seen in the 1930s. On this occasion, a short down goods hauled by N class 31867 is stopped for the driver to be advised on a cracked rail ahead in Sandling Tunnel. The same fate befells the Golden Arrow, headed by Battle of Britain Pacific, 34089, 602 Squadron. With a characteristic slip, the Pacific gets her train underway. Our final scenes featuring the Golden Arrow, one of the most famous trains on the Southern, are at Victoria and Paddock Wood, following the introduction of the BR Standard Pacifics. From 1951 to 1958, when the Britannias were transferred away from the southern region, the train was regularly entrusted to two members of the class based at Stewards Lane Shed in London. The end of an era came on the 11th of June 1961, when this famous train was hauled by steam for the last time. West Country Class 34100 Appledore brings the down Golden Arrow slowly through Paddock Wood on that day. The Southern Railway and the Southern Region of British Railways were the biggest users of Pullmans in Britain. The crowds are out near Chipstead on the line to Tattenham Corner on the 6th of June 1953 to see the Royal Train, headed by Schools Class 440-30915 Brighton, 
which was taking the royal party to see the derby. The royal train is followed by the so-called Bookie's Bell, an old Pullman train. The loco for this train is number 31822, the first of only six N1-class three-cylinder moguls built by the Southeastern in Chatham in 1922. Vying with the Golden Arrow for the title of the Southern's best-known train was the Brighton Bell, seen here passing through Weaversfield in BR days. C.J. Bernard had a cab ride on this famous train in 1939, from which we present these extracts. As the train leaves Victoria, an interloper in the form of a Drummond-designed T9440, complete with its eight-wheel tender, is seen. Judging from the amount of permanent way work seen going on during the course of the journey, this run must have been made on a Sunday. As the train crosses the Thames on the Grosvenor Bridge outside Victoria, the general lack of trains to be seen on these busy lines would seem to reinforce this assumption. Even the tracks on the approach to and through the normally hectic Clapham Junction are quiet, suggesting a journey made on a Sunday morning, possibly the 11 o'clock a.m. departure from the capital. We saw the precursor of this famous train earlier in the programme. This was the Southern Bell, which first ran between Victoria and Brighton in 1908. When the Brighton line was electrified, three five-car all Pullman electric multiple units were ordered by the Southern Railway. These began to operate the Southern Bell from the 1st of January 1933 when electric services on the Brighton line commenced. It was here at East Croydon that the Steam Hall Southern Bell was seen earlier in the program. Three units were the first and only all Pullman electric multiple units in the world. The name of the service was changed from the Southern Bell to that of the Brighton Bell on the 29th of June 1934. The original units continued to operate the service until they were withdrawn by British Rail in April 1972. With the exception of some years during the war when all Southern Pullmans were withdrawn, unit number 3052 was damaged in an air raid at Victoria in October 1940 but was subsequently repaired, being ready for traffic at the time when all Pullman services resumed on the Southern in October 1947. Look at the condition of the railway in these scenes. The tracks are not covered in litter, and the trackside environment and vegetation are beautifully maintained. Quite a different picture to that which pertains today. The train crosses over one of the great engineering features of the Brighton line, the Ouse Valley Viaduct, and passes a six-pull unit on a Brighton to Victoria working via the quarry line. The train halted at the signal, is headed by an E-Class 440 and composed of ex-Southeastern and Chatham stock. Brighton Bell approaches the 2,295-yard-long 2 Clayton Tunnel and arrives at Brighton, passing the works before arriving in the station. We stay with the LVSCR for the next part of the program, which features vintage Brighton steam classes, starting with the most elegant of designs, the H2-class Atlantics represented here by number 32425, Travorse Head. The locomotive is working a rail tour from London to Brighton in 1957. The carriages are ex-LSWR corridor stock.
Viewers will recall the footage of one of the Brighton Baltic tanks seen earlier in the programme, and that these locomotives were subsequently rebuilt by Maunsland to 460s. This is how they looked in their rebuilt form at London Bridge on the 23rd of June 1956. N15X class 460 32329 Stevenson prepares to work an enthusiast special to Brighton. This was one of the last of these rebuilt locomotives to remain in service and was withdrawn later that year. At Brighton, the loco goes off to the shed for servicing. Also at Brighton, on the 5th of October 1952, the works pilot, an A1X060 tank, number 377S, one of Stroudley's famous terrier tanks, designed going back to 1872. This locomotive was repainted in 1947 in Stroudley's distinctive yellow livery. Number 377S was an example of Marsh's rebuilding of the class in 1911. Though based at Brighton Works, the locomotive was occasionally allowed to stretch its legs. Here it hauls an enthusiast special on the goods-only Kemptown branch in Brighton. This line lost its passenger services in 1933, which was just over a mile in length. Another outing for the Terrier was when it helped the citizens of Surrey's dormitory town at Caterham to celebrate the centenary of their railway which opened for business on the 5th of August, 1856. The promotion of the line was the cause of a bitter dispute between the Brighton and the Southeastern companies at the time. Constructed as a single-track branch, the line was doubled in 1897 to cope with the growing commuter traffic. Electrification of the route was undertaken by the Southern Railway in March 1935. This is Amberley on the Mid-Sussex Line in April 1952. There are camping coaches in the goods yard where a Brighton E1R class 062 tank is shunting. On the main line, one of the pair of Bullied's diesel electric locomotives thunders through with a goods train. At Amberley could be seen this remarkable Aveling and Porter 040 locomotive, which was employed at a nearby lime works. It was really a traction engine on rails, complete with flywheel. And now a reminder of an industry which played an important role in North Kent and which generated a great deal of traffic for the railways. For many years, there were a large number of cement works in the area along the southern shores of the Thames Estuary, close to the Medway between Rochester and Gravesend. An essential ingredient of cement making being chalk, which is an abundant supply in this area. These chalk quarries had their own railway systems, which often operated on different levels. One of the largest of these systems was at Swanscombe which opened in 1825, owned by APCM Limited, Associated Portland Cement, originally built to a gauge of three foot, five and a half inches. This was later rebuilt in 1929 to standard gauge. In that year, five new Hawthorne Leslie 040 saddle tank locomotives were supplied. Later, a further locomotive arrived from the same builder in 1935. The final locomotive was supplied by Robert Stevenson Hawthorne in 1948. 
The locomotives were originally painted in an attractive light green livery and were kept clean. These scenes were filmed by Edwin Wilmshurst in 1968. When steam was withdrawn at the quarry, four of the steam locomotives were preserved by enthusiasts. The next part of the program will take us on a tour of some closed but certainly not forgotten lines which traverse the lush countryside of Sussex. This is the Cuckoo Line from Polgate through Hailsham to Eridge, which opened throughout in 1881. Built by the LBSCR, it never amounted to much more than a, a meandering secondary route which was never electrified and was closed in, throughout in 1963. The other line which wandered through rural Sussex suffered the same fate as the Cuckoo Line, or at least part of it did. East Grinstead had two stations. This is the low-level station. A push-pull train arrives at the high-level station from three bridges, Tunbridge Wells. Back at the low level station, a train approaches from the south on a line known then and now as the Bluebell Railway. The loco which is running around its train is one of the Brighton built British Railway Standard Class 4 264 tanks, number 8011. These engines were often used towards the end of services on the line between East Grinstead and Lewis. Having run round its train, the tank engine shunts the stock into the other platform before departure. Trains are briefly seen at East Grinstead's two stations before we head off 
down the Bluebell line. What was to become known as the Bluebell line was opened in the early 1880s to connect East Grinstead to Lewis. In 1883, a link three miles long was opened from Horsted Keynes on this route, joining the main Brighton line at Copyhold Junction. The electrified line to Copyhold Junction is seen here diverging to the right of the picture. In 1955, British Railways proposed closing the line. This was to come into effect on the 25th of May, 1955. However, in true Ealing comedy fashion, a few locals discovered the clause in the original Act of Parliament, which had authorised the construction of the line, stating that the original stations were to remain open in perpetuity. This is Sheffield Park, the present-day southern terminus of the route. The perplexed BR was forced to resume services, though it did so with such bad grace that these trains pointedly did not call at stations that were not mentioned in the original act. A clause enabling BR to close the line was inserted in a subsequent piece of legislation, and the last trains ran in March 1958. The stay of execution allowed a preservation scheme to be launched, and the Bluebell Railway Preservation Society became a pioneer of standard gauge railway preservation in Britain. Bluebell joined the Lewis to Tunbridge Wells line at Culver Junction, three and three quarter miles north of Lewis. At Lewis, a two-bill electric unit arrives at the station on a service from Seaford. An L1 class 440 brings the train in from Eastbourne. Edwin Wilmshurst filmed these scenes of a flooded Lewis station on the 5th of November 1960 it is hard to believe that trains could still get through in such conditions, but they did. K-Class Mogul 32348 splashes out of the station on a Brighton to Eastbourne train. The flooding was at its worst at the west end of the station. There would be no trains from this station for London via Kaima Junction on this day. Back to the Bluebell now. This is Horsted Keynes in the last week of BR services between Lewis and East Grinstead. A standard class 4 264 tank heads north out of the station. An electric multiple unit arrives from Hayward's Heath. A southbound service appears. Normal branch set has been reinforced to accommodate those wishing to travel on the line before closure. The headboard on the tank will later be the right way around when the train returns with the final service.
last train from Lewis arrives at East Grinstead to a cacophony of whistles and exploding detonators at the last train to East Grinstead. This was to be the scene repeated time and time again in the years ahead. Though as Dr. Beeching's butchery of Britain's railways got underway, the Bluebell Railway story had a happy ending. Indeed, it will not be too long now before steam trains, perhaps ones headed by Brighton Belt Standard tanks, are seen once again at East Grinstead, as the Bluebell Railway strives to complete the reconstruction of its line. Now for a look at two southern byways which were not as fortunate as the Bluebell. The four and three quarter mile branch from Dunton Green on the southeastern main line to Westrum was opened in July 1881. These scenes, filmed by Edwin Wilmshurst in the summer of 1961, not long before the line closed, on the 30th of October of that year, show H-class tank 044, 31533 and a four mile London Brighton South Coast push-pull set working the branch. Braisted Holt was the first stop out of Westrum. A train from Dunton Green arrives and pauses optimistically for passengers. Another western-bound train arrives at the next station, Chevening Holt. As a bullet Pacific flies through on the main line, the branch set awaits its next trip up the valley from Dunton Green. Moving further down the southeastern main line, we come to Paddock Wood. Pacific roars through on an express. A schools class 440 hurries a short down train through the station. Mansell Mogul on the stopping train leaves Paddock Wood almost simultaneously with the train for the Hawkehurst branch. An H-class 044 tank in charge of the branch line push pull set. Train for Paddock Wood arrives at Hormsman Den. Push pull set propelled by an H-class tank 31551. The train for Hawkers calls at the station. Goudhurst was the next station on this 11 and a half mile branch, which opened in September 1893. A train for Hawkers leaves Goudhurst with number 31551 again in charge. Closure notices were already posted at Cranbrook as number 31551 leaves there for Hawkehurst. With the locomotive at the rear, a train for Hawkehurst arrives at Cranbrook. The branch passed through pleasant but thinly populated countryside, much of it given over to the growing of hops. Hawker Station, which was about a mile from the centre of the village, was a regular destination for Hop Picker's Friends Specials.
The branch was steeply graded and the tank engine had to work hard on their push-pull trains. As the date for the withdrawal of passenger services in June 1961 approached, the trains were strengthened to accommodate those who came to mourn the passing of yet another branch line. On the last day of normal service, C-Class 060-31588 was brought in to work the service, the two-coach push-pull set being reinforced by the addition of three extra carriages. On the 11th of June 1961, the Locomotive Club of Great Britain organised a special train to say goodbye to the branch. This was powered by two former South Eastern 060s, 01 Class 31065 and C Class 31592. The train is seen here near Horsman Den. It was raining by the time the special reached Cranbrook. Our final scenes of the branch were appropriately enough filmed at Hawkehurst. The final part of the programme focuses on another Kentish branch, part of which is still very much in business, the Kentley Sussex Light Railway. It was opened between 1903 and 1905. It ran from Robertsbridge on the main line from London to Hastings the Headcorn and the southeastern line between Tunbridge and Ashford. The Kentney Sussex was operated as a light railway under the provisions of the Light Railways Act 1896. It came to be run by W. H. Austin, successor to the famous Colonel Stevens, who managed a nondescript collection of light railways from an office in Tunbridge. The line survived to become part of British Railways in 1948. This very rare 9.5 millimeter film was taken by Jim Joyce in 1952 shortly before the line's closure in January 1954. The train from Headcorn arrives back at Biddenden, the only station on the Headcorn extension that had a passing loop and a second platform. through the trees and hedgerows. Leaving High Holden Road. We are passing St. Michael's Holt. We now arrive at Rolvenden. The 01-31070 shunts its stock. This is the only known footage of Rolvin and Steamshed, with ex Kentney Sussex No. 3 Bodium, now 32670 on shed. Behind we can see the station. Note the gates and the 01 preparing to go up to Tenterden Town. Ascending Orpins Curve. On a different day, 31070 and an ex-London and South Western Railway bogey brake and SR brake van ascends Tenterden Bank towards St Mildred's Church. At Tenterden Town Station, a unique view showing the station, its second platform, three-armed signal and the water tank. Later the same day, number 3, 326070, couples up to a birdcage break at Tenterden Town Station for a trip to Robertsbridge Junction. 32670 shunts its train at Robertsbridge Junction. The line became freight only from January 1954 until June 1961.
A number of enthusiast specials and annual hop pickers trains ran during that period. Because of weight restrictions, trains requiring two locomotives had to have a second engine bringing up the rear. This train was organised by the Locomotive Club of Great Britain, named the South Eastern Limited and toured the line in 1961. Hinton and Bank with 32670 at the rear. A scene that would not be tolerated today, enthusiasts encroaching on the track. The train returns to Rolvenden for the last time. Note the desolation compared with earlier scenes. Bodium in the late 1920s. Locomotive number no. 8, Hesperus, ex Great Western Ringing Rock, with a train of ex London and South Western six wheel stock. The loco, running as an 042 saddle tank, charges across the ungated level crossing, so typical of a Colonel Stevens rural light railway. Note the fashionable ladies' hats of the period, seen when the train has returned to Bodium. Despite the worst efforts of officialdom and the long series of legal battles, part of the line reopened in June 1974. is dedicated to the memory of Charles Kensley, 1901 to 1974. Southern Railway Engineman, his inspiration to younger members of the railway, was a great help in the early days. There are five preservation societies striving to preserve vintage Southern steam for future generations to come. Let us hope that they continue to succeed in this important task, both now and in the future. These scenes were filmed on the 21st anniversary of the line's reopening in 1995. <laughs>